Ukraine is losing ground at the front. Volodar is on the brink of collapse, and back in Moscow, Putin just issued a new nuclear threat. Because of course he did. Honestly, it can be so exhausting. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Zelensky is in Washington, D.C., trying to lock in more Western support for what he says is his plan for victory. Now, we're going to start today with a map overview to give you an idea of the areas we're looking at. I'm using Deep State Map here, which is great for the purpose of this video. I will say that Suryak Map tends to be more up-to-date in terms of relatively minor changes at the front, but it's also quite a bit harder to easily read. So unless you're dissecting 10 to 50 meter changes on a daily basis, I tend to think that most of these mapping services are really just a matter of what you're most comfortable using. Anyways, starting here, zoomed out, the areas that are purple are Ukrainian territory captured by Russia in 2014. The light red is Ukrainian territory taken by Russian forces since 2022. The green is Ukrainian territory taken by Russia in 2022 and since liberated by Ukraine. And this little blue area, actually, is Russian territory in Kursk, now occupied by Ukrainian forces. So when we're looking at the hottest parts of the front, it's really in the north and east. Not as much is really going on in the south recently, but certainly still contested areas down there on a daily basis. Up north, we have the Ukrainian operation that pushed into Kursk, uh, Kursk, Russia, about six weeks ago. As of today, Ukraine still holds more than 1,100 square kilometers of territory. And despite some really confident media announcements, the Russian counteroffensive there hasn't really materialized at all. I mean, they've tried, but Ukraine still holds just about everything they took in the first week of that operation. Shifting to the east, we have Pokrovsk, which sits here between Bakhmut and Volodar. This is an area where Russian forces have rapidly advanced in recent weeks. Now, rapid, of course, in relation to how little the lines have moved previously in this war. Overall, it's very slow and a costly pace for the Russians, but it is much faster than we've seen elsewhere throughout the majority of this war. Now, we covered the Pokrovsk axis in a previous video, so check that out if interested in more details. But at the very least, it's worth noting that the loss of this city would be significant for Ukraine, and they're taking steps to avoid that. Now, on the one hand, some of those steps appear to have worked out. It does look like the Russian advance has slowed in recent days. Unfortunately, Russia has picked up speed a little southwest towards Volodar. So a week ago, the conversation was all about what if Pokrovsk falls, and now we can add that same concern to Volodar. Now, there's a few reasons Volodar is important. For starters, it's been heavily fortified over the course of not just this war, but dating back to 2014. It's a fortress, and as we saw at Avdivka earlier this year, when a fortress falls, it's often easier for the attacker to then rapidly advance further inland. Volodar is also the last fortified town before the village of Velka Novoselka and the entire southern portion of Donetsk that Ukraine currently controls. Russia has long said that their goal is to occupy and take over the Donetsk Oblast, and Volodar was one of the towns that so far has really been standing in their way. Starting with some Russian sources on the subject, Rybar, Russian media, recently reported, quote, the offensive at Volodar is actively developing. They reported on assault groups near the high-rise buildings, saying the enemy's positions to the northeast of Volodar are currently being burned out by drones with an incendiary mixture. They added that the last roads out of the city have been taken under fire control of the Russian military, saying there are no safe routes left for Ukraine to enter or exit. Adding that there's been quite a bit of footage at this point of Ukrainian prisoners being taken and massive strikes, usually with glide bombs, uh, on some of the more urban settings of Volodar. Adding to this was Russian telegram channel called Come and See, who said that the Ukrainian garrison of Volodar is currently in an operational encirclement. All roads from Volodar are already under fire, as mentioned previously, and now the enemy will no longer be able to leave it safely. Then turning to some Ukrainian or pro-Ukrainian sources on the challenges uh, currently being faced at Volodar, the Kiev Independent published a quote from analyst Emil Kastahelmi of the Blackbird Group saying, quote, I would be surprised if the battle goes on for much longer. I think we are seeing the end times of Volodar as we speak. And then Ted Aragami, a former Ukrainian military officer, added a quote to a Forbes article where he said, quote, it's clear that the situation in Volodar is critical, and we are likely witnessing the final stages of its defense. I can only hope that the right orders have been given, prioritizing the lives of soldiers over any desire to hold the ground. End quote. So the Russians are celebrating progress on the battlefield, and Ukrainian sources are openly concerned about major cities at risk of falling. Then out of left field, Putin drops his newest nuclear threat. It's a lot to keep up with, which is why the sponsor of today's video can be an excellent resource. 
Anyone who's watched this channel for a while knows that we try our absolute best to provide multiple perspectives around certain events to give us the best possible idea of what's going on. Of course, that's easier said than done. Not very many people have the time or the resources to sift through dozens, even hundreds of articles covering the same subject, but with the flood of information that we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis, that's kind of what it would require. So I'm happy to partner again here today with the best tool that I have found to help you navigate our chaotic information space, Ground News. Ground News breaks down topics to show you how they're being covered from organizations historically on the political left, right, or center. Then they even provide a factuality rating, again, based off of the publication's track record. Take, for example, this recent coverage around the congressional report on the Afghanistan withdrawal that was released on September 9th. So we've got 105 total sources, and you can choose to select options from the left, right, or center. Uh, and then my favorite feature here, or one of my favorite features here, you can hide the paywall articles. That is always so annoying, right? You're interested in a topic, you find a good article, you click on it, think you're going to read it. Just kidding. Now, while all of that work at this point is all well and good, and you're taking additional steps to better understand the information space, we all still do have our own blind spots. And Ground News actually has a feature to help with that. Strangely enough, it's called, you guessed it, blind spot. So on this page, they list out topics that are getting heavily skewed coverage from one side or another, meaning that you may not come across these in your daily news consumption. So again, I've worked with Ground News in the past, and I'm happy to continue spreading awareness about their product. I mean, look, this digging into stories from multiple angles is kind of what I do all day, every day. And I haven't found any other website or app nearly as effective as Ground News. So if you want to start seeing through media bias, use my link ground.news slash Preston or scan the QR code on the screen for 40% off a Vantage subscription. Russian President Vladimir Putin said Wednesday during a permanent meeting of the Security Council that Russia would expand the conditions under which it's prepared to use nuclear weapons. He outlined a revision of Moscow's nuclear doctrine, which was pretty clearly aimed at discouraging the West from allowing Ukraine to strike Russia with longer-range weapons. And at first glance, it appears to significantly lower the threshold for the possible use of nuclear weapons. The response to this was, as you would expect, with U.S. Secretary of State Blinken saying, quote, changing Russia's nuclear doctrine is irresponsible, especially at a time when leaders are gathering in New York at the United Nations General Assembly to discuss ongoing crises. To give an idea of how this change was interpreted in Russian media, looking at Russian mill blogger Alexander Kotz, he added some useful context here, saying, quote, here, of course, it would be useful to clarify the interpretation of the first point. For example, is the participation of NATO equipment in the invasion of the Kursk region support for a nuclear state? Although most likely this is in connection with the fact that the West wants to give Ukraine permission to strike with its long-range missiles deep inside of Russia, the president recently said that flight assignments in them are entered by not by the Ukrainians, but by specialists from NATO, which isn't true, by the way. And this means that they will be directly participating in these strikes. In turn, the specialists of a nuclear country will support a non-nuclear state, which can finally be hit in accordance with our nuclear deterrence strategy. Now, look, it's one guy's assessment, but that's generally how this news was received across some of the louder voices in Russian media. This is essentially Putin's way of saying that if the West gives Ukraine permission to strike inside of Russia with Western-provided munitions, then Russia considers the nuclear option to be on the table. Now, I'm not one to brush aside the risk of nuclear war, but it's also not something that should be threatened as often as Russia throws it around. I mean, no matter how unlikely anyone views Russia using their nuclear weapons, the fact that they have them has to be considered. Now, one item that's often brought up in the Putin would never crowd is the idea that Russia's nuclear arsenal is old and run down. Essentially, look at how their army, navy, and air force are performing in Ukraine. Do we really think their nuclear force is the exception? has avoided all corruption, is properly maintained, and is actually what Russia says it is. Funny enough, we actually have an event this week sort of playing into that uh, when a new Russian ICBM prematurely detonated during testing. What we know right now is that Russia recently conducted an unsuccessful test of the RS-28 Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile. The Sarmat is supposed to be a key component of Russia's strategic nuclear modernization program, and it officially entered combat duty in September of 2023. However, it's experienced at least four failed tests to this date, with the only successful one having occurred in April of 2022. Right now, it looks like the missile exploded in the silo, leaving a pretty significant crater and causing serious damage to the test site. And I should note that while this missile could be equipped with a nuclear warhead, it was not during this testing. 
We also have satellite imagery showing the launch site before and after the test, where a crater approximately 62 meters in diameter is formed as a result of the explosion. So that's what's going on in Russia. Now let's shift over to what Ukraine is doing to try to win the war on their terms. Historian Timothy Ash added some necessary context to President Zelensky's current visit to the United States when he said, quote, This may be the last chance to enable Ukraine to achieve something that can be plausibly called victory. Otherwise, Kyiv will probably be forced to sue for a cessation of hostilities sometime in the next year, negotiating from a position of weakness. That would not be peace, just a pause before another round of war. In Ukraine, there would be despair and fury, and the Kremlin rejoicing. And in the rest of the world, most consequently of all, swirling contempt for the weakness of the West. Right now, Ukrainian President Zelensky is in the United States for the United Nations General Assembly, and he kicked off his visit at the Scranton Army Ammunition Plan, where he thanked workers for providing Ukraine with munitions and said the facility would ramp up production of 155mm artillery shells crucial for the ongoing war effort. During that visit, Zelensky said, quote, It is in places like this where you can truly feel that the democratic world can prevail. Thanks to people like these in Ukraine, in America, and in all partner countries who work tirelessly to ensure that life is protected. Now, Zelensky's been teasing out a plan in recent weeks to end the war on Ukraine's terms, and he presented it to key U.S. leaders, culminating with President Biden yesterday. Speaking to that plan, Zelensky said, quote, Partners often say, we will be with Ukraine until it's victory. Now we clearly show how Ukraine can win and what is needed for this. Very specific things. Let's all do this today while all the officials who want victory for Ukraine are still in official positions. Now, the details of the plan haven't been made public, but there are a few key aspects that have sort of leaked, in a sense. One is expected to be the security guarantee of NATO membership. Another has to do with permission for Ukraine to strike targets inside of Russia with Western-provided munitions. And a third is tied to ramping up near-term security assistance to allow Ukraine to gain the upper hand on the battlefield. But it wasn't just Biden that Zelensky is meeting with during his time here in the United States. He also had a 90-minute closed-door session with U.S. lawmakers. Before diving into that, I do want to mention that there's a pretty serious political aspect here. Vice President Harris's statements with Zelensky and then Trump's recent comments on the overall war, I'm not going to get into those. It's all tied up in domestic partisan politics, and that's not really a strong suit of mine. I think we can still discuss the war and what's happening right now with currently elected heads of state. That said, I am working on a few forward-looking videos, and I've reached out to both the Harris and Trump campaigns to see if they'd like to provide someone to relay their message about a few of these key national security topics. Now, according to some reporting from The Hill, Ukrainian President Zelensky told a bipartisan group of senators on Thursday that he could bring Russia to the negotiating table next year if the Biden administration speeds up shipments of weapons to Ukraine and greenlights missile strikes deeper into Russia. Zelensky supposedly told senators that he needs more F-16s and long-range missiles with the capability to strike more than 100 miles into Russia, promising that Russian President Vladimir Putin would negotiate a peace deal if his own country faces a greater military threat. Republican Senator John Heaven said, quote, He's saying that within the military aid package that we've already provided, that if he can get the right things that he believes he can force Putin to the table next year and start to negotiate peace. I think that's the real upshot. Now, Zelensky appears to have argued the capability to strike deeper into Russia could end the war swiftly and perhaps stave off the need for Congress to pass another military aid package on top of the $61 billion approved in April. Republican Senator John Cornyn said, quote, Congress has acted, but the administration resists following through in the weapons that Congress has already appropriated money for. And they're in our stockpiles, and the Biden administration officials have been slow walking delivering them to the Ukrainians. The message is that the longer we slow walk the weapons and put restrictions on their ability to use them against Russian stockpiles, energy resources, and the like, the longer this war will go on. If we were to give them the authorities to use the weapons the way they want and deliver them on a timely basis, I think President Zelensky believes that this war has a better chance of being resolved at the negotiating table. This is a point often hammered home by our allies in Eastern Europe and echoed by Rimvias Velatka, which I apologize for that pronunciation, a Lithuanian reporter this week who said, quote, Ukraine is still asking the United States for permission to use Western weapons to attack Russian military bases in Russia, but the U.S. will not allow this. It is shamefully demanding that Ukraine fight the war against Russia with its hands tied. Ukraine's recent attacks on Russian ammunition depots are also a signal to NATO that Ukraine will soon no longer be dependent on Western missiles, but will develop and build its own weapons. 
There is, of course, speculation that President Biden, during the next week or so, will grant Ukraine the approval to use U.S.-provided munitions to strike inside of Russia. But while we wait on that decision, he went ahead and announced a new aid package to Ukraine and framed it in a way that I don't think I've seen before. President Biden, in a statement, said, quote, Today I am announcing a surge in security assistance for Ukraine and a series of additional actions to help Ukraine win this war. I could be wrong, but I think that might be the first time that Biden has outright said that the goal is for Ukraine to win this war. I'm sure it's come out before, but when you're looking at some of this official messaging, the U.S. has tended to be very delicate and is focused on, you know, Ukraine resisting or something like that. Remember all of the statements for as long as it takes, but they wouldn't actually say what the end state was? This statement about Ukraine winning the war does seem new. Now, as a part of this announcement, President Biden said that he had directed the Department of Defense to allocate all of its remaining security assistance funding that had been appropriated for Ukraine by the end of his term in office, so the next few months here. Adding to that, as a part of this effort, the Department of Defense will allocate the remaining Ukraine security assistance initiative funds by the end of this year. He said that the Department of Defense is announcing $2.4 billion in security assistance through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, which will provide Ukraine with additional air defense unmanned aerial systems or drones, and air-to-ground munitions, as well as strengthen Ukraine's defense industrial base and support its maintenance and sustainment requirements. Oh yeah, speaking of aid to Ukraine, uh, we just raised over $30,000 last month for the medics of the 47th Mechanized Brigade. I'll list the names of those who gave more than $100 for that effort here on the screen. Uh, The medics first purchased a vehicle to move the other medics and supplies between aid stations, as well as serve as a backup Kazakh vehicle. The next batch of purchases is ongoing right now, and based on the needs outlined by the unit commander, it's a series of electronic warfare equipment that jams or detects Russian drones. The jammers are being installed onto existing medevac vehicles with the hopes of keeping those valuable life-saving equipment uh, in the fight even longer. Now, at the end of this month, I'm going to be consolidating all the receipts to share. So we have a very clean accounting of where every dollar went, how it was donated, and how it was spent. Now, thank you all so much for your generosity. It means the absolute world to me and to the medics of the 47th and has gone a long way in saving even more lives. Now, our next fundraise is focused on more electronic warfare jammers and drones for the 47th. And the link is in the description if you're interested in contributing. But back to Biden's most recent announcement. To enhance Ukraine's long-range strike capabilities, President Biden said that he has decided to provide Ukraine with the joint standoff weapon long-range munition. This is kind of like a glide bomb. It's been around for a while. Uh, It'll actually allow a 1,000-pound bomb to strike targets accurately out past 130 kilometers. So yes, it's a new capability, kind of. It's an air-delivered standoff munition, shorter range than the Storm Shadow with roughly a similar warhead. Moving back to Biden's statement, he said that uh, to further strengthen Ukraine's air defenses, he directed the Department of Defense to refurbish and provide Ukraine with an additional Patriot air defense battery and to provide Ukraine with additional Patriot missiles, saying that this builds on his decision earlier this year to divert U.S. air defense exports to Ukraine, which will provide Ukraine with hundreds of additional Patriot and AMRAAM missiles over the next year and will help Ukraine to defend its cities and its people. So essentially, Ukraine will continue to be the priority for U.S. assistance, especially when we're talking about air defense. We can only produce so many Patriots and interceptors, and there's a long line of allies waiting to get those platforms. So for now, at least, while Ukraine is actively facing a threat in their skies overhead, they'll be at the top of that list to get any new ones marked for export. Finally, President Biden said that to build on the capacity of Ukraine's Air Force, he directed the Department of Defense to expand training for Ukrainian F-16 pilots, including by supporting the training of an additional 18 pilots next year. And he closed by saying, quote, through these actions, my message is clear. The United States will provide Ukraine with the support it needs to win this war. So this is a big week for the future of Ukraine. I I know we often watch the battlefield, track progress at the front, and decipher deep strikes inside of each country. But I think these next few days will actually be a reminder that this war very well may be won or lost far from the line of contact. Think of the items on the table right now for a decision. Zelensky is putting forward a plan that he thinks will win the war on their terms. Biden is talking about doing whatever is needed for Ukraine to win while there's active discussion about sending more aid more quickly and possibly permitting Ukraine to strike inside of Russia. And if that wasn't enough, Ukraine's possibly joining NATO is again in the headlines as so many world leaders get together at the United Nations. There's too many moving parts here to make any sort of coherent prediction as to where this all goes, but it's all worth paying attention to as things could shift very quickly.
But that's all I've got for now. Thank you again to the sponsor of today's video, Ground News. Their product really is solid and can be a great tool in helping to sift through the chaos that is our modern news cycle. Be sure to check them out in the pinned comment or description below if interested. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.